Absolutely. Yes. Sir. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining today's session. Today, we'll be speaking on Nigerian labor employment and social laws, consciousness and application. Nigerian labor employment and social laws, consciousness and application. Our facilitator today is Vivian Oko Olu Tufeshe. She's the founder, Vivian Olu Tufeshe and Associates. I'm also excited to say she's also an active member of the HR mentorship. I would just like to read about her profile briefly so that we can get to know her better and pay attention. She has a bachelor's of law from Olabisi Onobanjo University, OOU. She was called to the Nigerian bar and also has a master's from the University of Lagos, a master's, of course, um, in, in law. I also like to add a few more things so that we get to know the person speaking to us today. Vivian is experienced in corporate social legal practice. While she started out her career in private practice within two mid-sized law firms, she pivoted into in-house legal advisory with two multinationals operating within the fast moving consumer goods industry. At the moment, okay, she manages a law firm, Vivian Ulutu Fusi and Associates, that focuses on legal risk and compliance with the aim of closing the legal knowledge gap in Nigeria. She also doubles as a director in Print Vitex Limited, a garment printing and lifestyle production fashion company focused on creating quality impressions for brand owners. She has a global mindset, and her goal is to drive best strategic collaboration, partnership, lead sustainable and profitable outcomes through transformation leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's receive the gift of Barista Vivian. You have the floor, ma'am. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much. I almost didn't know that um, profile was for me. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on this topic. Um, this topic is quite an interesting one for me because I do have a flair for employment related matters, especially when you view employment related matters from a risk angle. And of course you consider the fact that um, human resource is hugely linked with um, human rights. So of course you can't divorce both sides and human rights is something that I'm particularly big on. Um, even though we might want to look at the commercial arrangements or we might want to look at labor from a contractual point of view, the fact is that we are dealing with humans. And that is actually what makes labor and employment law peculiar. That's what makes labor and employment law special because of that human factor. And the fact that it is ever evolving, it is ever dynamic, and you can't particularly say that this is the representation you would meet when you even have a similar matter. You know, situations differ from uh, case to case, uh, on a case to case basis. So I would like to start with us looking at um, the objectives for, for this presentation. Um, I do hope that at the end of this presentation, um, I would have been able to raise your consciousness in terms of the various social and labor and employment laws that apply in the workplace. I also envisage that um, we'll keep abreast of um, rights and obligations that um, parties have parties involved in employment relationships in the workplace have to each other. Um, parties in terms of the employer and the employee and the agents in terms of um, the applicable rights and obligations or those who, who are relevant stakeholders within that relationship. I also envisage that by the end of this um, presentation, we would have looked at certain decided cases um, on labor and employment matters. Also new laws and evolving trends within the labor space and the consequences for business. And then uh, the atmosphere that will promote 
industrial harmony in the workplace. And then just briefly touch on the subject of responsibilities of the industrial arbitration panel and then the national industrial court and the role that the national industrial court plays in resolving um, labor and employment matters and also broadening the uh, landscape or the framework for labor and industrial matters. Now to help us navigate through this, I will just do a summary on the expectations. Um, kindly give me a few minutes, there's somebody knocking. I'm so sorry, it's just me and my kids. So the nanny has just joined us. Please give me just one minute to attend to her, to open the door for her, please. My apologies. That's, that's good. So while, while we wait for our facilitator, okay, these are some of the challenges of work from home. You know, I have to make accommodation for, for things like this. This summary looks quite interesting. Definitions, basis of rights and obligations, employee rights, employee duties, controversial areas, in brackets, unsettled law, strategies and implementation framework, what should human resource partners or business leaders do now? And then conclusion. One thing I've come to realize is that uh, Perhaps as a singular block outside the <coughs> area of academics or study of human HR or industrial relations, lawyers are the singular block in, in HR. Okay, so sometimes we may have to become associate lawyers to be able to excel on this job or most old lawyers there. So if you have lawyers in your organization, either in the legal department, please be their friend. Madam Vivian is back. I was just holding for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So just to help us navigate through um, the presentation, this is a bit of summary of the topics that we'll be discussing. We'll be looking at definitions. And when we're speaking about definitions, basic definitions that we all know, but we'll just brush off on those. And we'll be looking at the basic rights and obligations of um, employees and of employers. Um, we'll be looking at um, the controversial areas and of course the unsettled laws and then the emerging areas and then um, strategies and implementation framework and then we'll conclude. So for definition, various framework and when I'm saying various framework, I mean texts, I mean statutes have tried to lend um, their own perspectives on who an employer is or who an ideal employer is. But of course, um, for the purpose of this presentation, I decided to pick one and um, it's situated in section 91 of the Labor Act. Um, the Labor Act, as we know, is the principal legislation that guides employment and labor related uh, relationship in Nigeria. Now the Labor Act, specifically defines an employer as um, a person who has entered into a contract of employment to employ any other. Okay. To employ any other person as a worker, either for himself or for the service of any other person and includes the agent, the manager, or factor to the first mention. So that's um, the uh, personal representatives or person who works for either of these parties or is or are personal representatives. Then of course, um, the ECA, I, I find the ECA quite robust in defining who an employee is. Now I say the ECA is quite robust in, uh, in defining who an employee is, because when you look at the Labor Act, there seems to be this um, uh, limiting definition of who a worker is. Now, the Labor Act, you know, try to give a distinction between who a worker is and who a non-worker is. Um, and of course, the limiting description given to a worker is that persons who um, occupy uh, managerial positions, administrative positions, clerical positions will not be classified as a worker, all right? But then um, we do know that the NIC and generally 
um, the Labor Act forms a principal piece of legislation. So when we need to still resolve matters, um, transcending the definition given to workers under the Labor Act, we still use the Labor Act to um, resolve such matters. So um, the ECA section 73 provides a very um, fantastic definition for who a worker is and defines a worker as a person employed by an employer under oral or written contract of employment, whether on a continuous basis, whether on a continuous part-time, temporary apprenticeship or casual basis, and includes surprisingly a domestic servant who is not a member of the family or a member of the family of the employer, including any person employed in federal, state, or local government and any of the government agencies and in the formal and informal sectors. So you can, we can all see that the definition of employee transcends just, you know, those who are junior workers as captured under the Labor Act to even include on a robust basis uh, and recognize the rights that those in uh, part-time employment have, those in temporary employment have, um, domestic servants have, the rights that domestic servants have, even those within the informal sector. So we might need to skew our policies. If we have these sets of persons within our employment, we might need to skew our policies to capture this uh, interest. Then of course, uh, we all hear about employment contracts, but then, when we hear about employment contracts, what comes to mind is just the contractual framework. So the offer letter or maybe the contract of employment, but then the employment contracts transcends just the contractual term, right? It transcends the letters of what the parties have decided to contractually, contractually be liable to. You have statutes that speak to employment law. You have judicial decisions of the NIC or of courts that um, had the power to interpret laws on labor and employment matters before the NIC, that's the National Industrial Court of Nigeria, came mainstream. You also have collective bargaining agreements. So when we're um, involved, when a worker is involved with, with a trade union, of course, as a collective, they come together to um, agree on collective bargaining agreements. So by extension, the collective bargaining agreement forms part of um, the contractual arrangements that will be used to define the existing relationship between both parties. You also have the internal workings of the company or the policies and the framework that help for the operational uh, or drive the operational and the administrative aspects of the business. Now, if that forms part of the policy and procedure in which a worker is expected to abide by uh, and has agreed to is in the know of, it forms part of that contractual arrangement as, uh, as well. Then one of such is the disciplinary uh, code of conduct, uh, disciplinary procedure or the code of conduct or the handbook. This forms part of uh, this handbook and the uh, policy uh, procedures, even the SOPs standard operating procedures for each of the department um, workflow, it forms part of uh, what will be defined as the conditions of service and then the employment contract that will be used to define the nature of the relationship that an employer has with an employee. Then um, I'm seeing something on my screen. I don't know what is happening, but I would, I would uh, go on. Then you have the conventions, you have the uh, labor standards, and then you have the international law and best practice. So moving ahead. Moving ahead, um, just to give more credence to the statutes that address labor and employment law matters. The 1999 constitution, and it's quite surprising that I'm mentioning the 1999 constitution because the 1999 constitution provides for 
the developmental policy and drive of the government to look into the welfare of employees in the context of the workplace. So you find section 17 within chapter two of the constitution addressing, um, addressing issues on minimum wage or giving credence to the fact that policies need to drive minimum wage, um, addressing issues on pensions, addressing issues on um, equality of rights, human dignity, opportunity for adequate means of livelihood and suitable employment. It also looks at the developmental drive on humane conditions of work, health and safety and welfare, equal pay for equal work, and of course, non-discriminative activities as it concerns the welfare of um, employees. Now, within the context of what drives the court, that is the NIC now, that's the National Industrial Court, in addressing labor-related matters exclusively, right? You have the third alteration of the 1999 Constitution that uh, gave birth to the establishment of the powers that the NIC has. Now, before um, the third alteration of the 1999 constitution came into mainstream, the um, National Industrial Court Act of 2006 established the NIC. But then the third alteration of the constitution now gave the NIC, that's the National Industrial Court of Nigeria, exclusive powers to administer or to sit on or to address labor and employment matters in Nigeria exclusively, you know, higher and above any other court. So what that simply means is that where there's a civil claim on revolving around labor and employment, whether it has to do with the employee, whether it has to do with um, trade union, acting on behalf of the employee, whether it has to do with the employee's benefits, pension, liabilities um, arising from that relationship, the NIC is to go to court to addressing those. And what gives the NIC the power to carry on? Yes, that exclusive right, you know, in sitting on labor and employment related matters is a third alteration um, to the 1999 constitution, you know, that was given birth to in the year 2011. Then you also have the chapter four of the constitution that speaks to the fundamental human rights of, of humans. You know, when I started my introductory or my introduction or my introductory speech, I did mention that labor and employment related matters are peculiar because you have an interplay of human rights. So it's not viewed as an ordinary commercial transaction or a, a just a contractual transaction. You are looking at the human interest here. So definitely the chapter four of the constitution comes into play in addressing the fundamental rights of an employee being a human. And these rights are non-negotiable. So what that simply means is that you can't even have a contractual arrangement where you partially negotiate those rights, okay? So you have the usual uh, fundamental rights which addresses the right to life, um, dignity of human person. Under dignity of human person, you have um, issues on slavery and servitude, the law frowning on slavery and servitude. You also have liberty, personal liberty, fair hearing, and fair hearing is a big deal because um, when the issues that arises in the workplace um, and then um, decisions have to be made by the employer or persons who stand in the gap to take to taking decisions on, on behalf of the employer, issue of uh, natural justice comes in and that's where fair hearing comes in. Um, you also have privacy. Privacy is a big issue when it comes to fundamental human rights of uh, employees, you have their data and their personal rights. 
these are non-negotiable rights of employees. At what point would you say that you can uh, have the employee's data? To what extent can you use the employee's personal data? And the other personal data that that employee has provided for you, to what extent can you use that data? So the, the fundamental rights of that employee speaks in that instance. You have a uh, court conscience and religion. Um, not to be discriminated against freedom of expression, freedom of association, you know. So in the workplace, are there avenues for an employee to express his or her opinion uh, or misgivings about certain um, issues that are going on in the workplace? How are grievances held or heard in the workplace, you know? Uh, and freedom of association, you're talking about the freedom to join trade unions. That's where the freedom of association comes in. And these rights cannot be fettered. They cannot be negotiated. Now, let me put another antidote. The only reason why you can appeal um, from the NIC, the only reason why you can appeal a matter from the NIC has to be hinged on uh, a misgiving on fundamental human rights. That is why it's, that's to the Court of Appeal, being the Court of Last, last uh, Instance in hearing um, labor-related matters. So in such an instance, companies need to have a watertight approach in assuring the fundamental human rights of their employees, you know, so that they're not caught up, you know, in this instance. So as of right, the only reason, you know, that you would appeal your matter from the NIC to the Court of Appeal as a court of last instance in hearing that matter will be hinged on a failure or a misgiving on fundamental human rights, right? And then um, for you to um, appeal on other, other, other um, issues that are not related to fundamental human rights, you would need a leave of the Court of Appeal. So what that simply means is that you have to go to the Court of Appeal to beg the Court of Appeal to grant you a leave for you to appeal there, right? So it shows you how um, strengthening or how strong the issue on fundamental human rights um, is when it comes to interpreting the relationship between an employer and employee. And I must do say, and I'll also say rather, that most issues that we see revolving around um, misgivings on labor and employment related, related, related matters are most times hinged on fundamental human rights, most of the times. So it's very important that um, businesses, you know, drive policies in line to have these aspects covered, you know, um, within their organization. Then you have the principal legislation governing employment related matters in Nigeria, which is the Labor Act. I mentioned already that the definition of worker is restricted under um, the Labor Act. However, we've still found situations where we have to still fall back or the NIC has to still fall back or in giving advice or opinion, we still have to fall back to the provisions of the uh, Labor Act to guide us, uh, you're right. So in one of such situations is where there is no oral, where there is no written agreement, you know, where agreements fall within the three months period, where written, a written statement ought to have given. If there's an issue that arises within the framework of that employment relationship, the Labor Act tends to guide um, in interpreting the relationship between the employer and the employee. You also have um, ritual redundancy. Most recently, um, in September, the NIC passed a judgment, you know, Green, um, Shokwenyi, Arif, and uh, Greenwich Data Limited, where it had to go back, where the question of, you know, whether a redundancy has been declared or a redundancy was declared and it was the basis for the termination of the employment of 
of um, an, an employee. The court held that it was, a redundancy was declared, and it had to still refer the empl employer to section 20 of the Labor Act to use that procedure in coming up with reasonable terms of settlement, you know, hinged on redundancy for the aggrieved employee, whom the court found that uh, matter in his favor at the end of the day. The labor is also relevant in looking at aspects of uh, labor contractors and um, fee charging employment agencies. It's within the context of the Labor Act that the Ministry of Labor is empowered to license and register labor contractors, you know, uh, monitor the activities of fee paying employment agencies. So there's no way we can do without the Labor Act. It's complementary, even though the definition of worker within the Labor Act is limited to a certain cadre or uh, type of person. Um, the third statute that you have, the federal statute, is the Employee Compensation Act. You know, it covers for actions and activities that will kick off, you know, in the event of death, dis disability, permanent or temporary disability, um, injury or disease of an employee, which arises in the course of employment. Now, when they say something arises in the course of employment, as at today, with the interpretation given by the Employee Compensation Act on what workplace means, the definition now has been broadened. With the um, relevant growth that has happened in terms of remote working and the shift in labor, rather than working in one location. The fact that labor now has transcended to the virtual space, the fact that labor now has transcended to my kitchen, to my bedroom, to my, to my parlor, you know, I'm still within the framework of in the course of employment. So that simply means that a lot of things have happened. Liabilities has been expanded, right? So the, Employee Compensation Act, right, prescribes that um, an employer of labor must deduct 1% of uh, the monthly salary and remit that to the fund. And the NSI PF is in charge of administering that fund. Um, I happened to witness, um, while I was still working with an organization where we unfortunately lost our HR manager at that time. I happened to witness um, the application process of, and the payments made, and even up to date, they're still paying the beneficiary, his beneficiary, who apparently was not working at that time, because that's also the uh, prerequisite. The scale of um, the scale of payment that, of payment on liabilities that were applied will differ if you are working or if you are a depend, full dependent, right? Um, it's all, your, your salary is also a factor of it. The salary of the deceased or the salary you know, of the person is also a factor. And then let's just assume that the person at that time was earning 1.5 million Naira monthly, right? What that simply means is that <clears throat> on a monthly basis, the beneficiary would be getting 90% of that monthly salary. So in as much as we are looking at this as a cost out pay, we should look at it you know, from, the, from the positive point of view and look, looking at it from the positive point of view is appreciating the fact that this is a social insurance and it's something that helps to cushion right, um, the cost that the employer would even have had to bear or had to bear part of in the event of the eventuality. Another thing I also want to bring out is the fact that it's an alternative to the employee filing an action in court and asking for damages under common law. So what that simply means is that if an event or liability has occurred within the course of employment, 
and then um, the employee decides not to use the ECA but uh, to recover, right? Compensation or indemnity for the loss that has occurred, right? He can, the employee can decide or the ex-employee, because I, what I found is that it's former employees that proceed to court on this basis. The former employee can proceed to court uh, to demand for damages in this regard, and um, they won't be able to benefit from the ECA. There are procedures to this. You can look up the act to see the requirements, to see the eligibility criteria. There's a window, window period in which you can apply for this. So it's extremely important. And the NSITF is in charge of, of that. So moving ahead, we have the Industrial Training Act, which promotes the skill economy of indigenous Nigerians. So it's, um, so I did say the, the Industrial Training Act, you know, the intention behind that act is to promote the skill economy of the indigenous manpower. And the way that the government has done this is to mandate companies to contribute 1% of their total annual payroll to the fund. And then in, in the alternative, right, in the reverse, any, they, they get 50%, you know, um, rebate or refund for any um, expense that they have made in training, right? So that's the essence of, of the Industrial Training Act. So there's a compliance point here, and it's um, important that um, HR practitioners should take note of that. And then the cutoff is the cutoff is that um, there's a mandatory minimum threshold of um, five or more employees. So if you have an organization where you are below five employees and you do not have a turnover of 50 million naira, you, know, you won't be required to um, remit this one percent. Then you have the Pension Reform Act that uh, promotes and governs the administration of uniform contribut contributory and pension scheme in organizations, private and public at the same time. Just like the Industrial Training Act, there is also a minimum threshold as well. So, um, sorry, <laughs> I apologize. No, okay, so there's a minimum threshold of expectation of um, 15 employees for for the private sector. And then um, if you are self-employed or you're less than three employ uh, employees, you can access the voluntary scheme. Now, the fantastic thing about of what I've discovered recently about the Pension Reform Act with the recent introduction is the fact that you can use 30% of your contribution to access mortgage. Now, what that means is that you can use 30% as equity contribution. So it pushes, it pushes, it helps you reduce your, you know, spending or the money that you stake out there because already it's a pool. You've been contributing to this fund for a pretty long time. And if you want to access a mortgage, whether through your cooperatives in your office, you can use this. You don't need to now have the liquid cash on you to access uh, your, a mortgage in Nigeria from a PMI or from uh, a commercial bank. You can use 30% of your, your, your pension contribution that you have done so far as equity contribution. So for example, if you're taking a um, 10 million Naira worth of mortgage, right? in your organization, you have set of persons who are taking a 10 million naira worth of mortgage each, you batch them up. If they have been contributing for a, for, for a pretty long time, and then the equity contribution on it is, let's say, 2 million, already uh, they are, the 30% of their pension has already catered for that. So they don't have to bring out any liquid cash to or contributions to make. So these are one of the advantages and these are the things that you can also pen down 
you know, and share with um, your colleagues at the office, you know, as as avenues for them to for welfare and improve life lifestyle. Then you have the Trade Union Act uh, 2004 that promotes and provides guidelines for registration of trade unions in Nigeria. Um, so there's a list of the structured trade unions affiliated with the central labor organization that caters for the junior workers. You have the senior staff and the employer association as well, you know, that speaks to management. So um, the trade union provides for the registrar of trade unions, it provides for formation of trade unions, the restriction of names, cancellation, dissolution, and then all the models of operandi, you know, on the at a basic level or a foundational level for trade unions in Nigeria. Then moving ahead, you have the Trade Union Disputes Act that promotes resolution of trade disputes. So inter-union matters, right? These are or employer union sometimes, depending on how, how the um, suit is, would go before the industrial arbitration panel for resolution. So this act provides for procedures that guide that process. You have the Factories Act that uh, promotes and governs health and safety and welfare in the factory. It's a very robust act. And I recommend that each of us, if we haven't read this act, I think we should read it. At some point, the federal government, um, there were works on the table, I think it was during the, during, uh, what's his name now? This is a job guy, good luck, Jonathan Zera. They wanted to review the act, review part of the act, you know, but then nothing came out of it at the end of the day. So um, the act is still what it is. It's a very old act, but it's very, very relevant as of today. And it's to surprise you the def what the definition of factories are. So the definition of factories transcends, it's not just the normal uh, picture risk um, view of a factory, right? So even your one shop can be a factory. And then the essence of having this factory act is to ensure health and safety of persons who interact in the workplace. I'm still looking at the welfare of employees. And if you look at all of this, uh, talking about health, cleanliness, overcrowding, ventilation, talking about safety, machinery, precautionary measures as to all of these perils and these issues, talking about welfare, you know, in, in the factory. But unfortunately, what I've discovered is that, you know, those who inspect, the inspectors just focus on the big factories. They're not looking at these other places. You hear fire incidents in uh, Ted Yosho, you hear fire incidents there, you know, it's all of these things that have been left under the table that hasn't created visibility, enough visibility. So they don't focus on those small, small businesses. They just focus on the big businesses. And then uh, most of these safety issues, you know, are, are left and then they result in bigger problems for employees who work within such um, unstructured organization. So the Factories Act, provides for, for this. And of course, on the long run, it helps in the welfare of employees in an organization. Then you have the personal income tax that speaks to promoting deductions and remittances of personal income tax of employees. And then there's a scale of remittance, which I, I do not want to go to, into for the purpose of this um, presentation. And then um, the uh, IRS, that's the Internal Revenue Service, where remittances will be made, will be hugely dependent on you know, where the employee is domiciled. Then um, you have, sorry, you have the National Housing Fund Act, you know, that promotes and provides guidelines for deductions or remittances of uh, remittances to the Nigerian Mortgage Bank. The expectation is that 2.5% of basic salaries that's another compliance point 
of um, an em, 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 of the employee, the employer is mandated to you know, make those remittances on the, make those deductions and make those remittances. Now, the good thing about this is that um, it provides an avenue for employees to access mortgage. So if there's a framework internally, you know, within your organizations where you can encourage your employees to do this, you know, that, that also helps to beef up um, their welfare package too as well. Then you have the International Labor Convention. Now the ILO is the only tripartite United Nations agency, you know, set up since 1919 to bring together government, employers, and workers' representatives, you know, from the member states to set labor standards. And some of the labor they set quite a number of labor standards. But of course, some of the labor standards that we currently adopt in Nigeria are this. Um, four ILO conventions. The one on the cost labor, it's been imputed into the Labor Act. It's also been imputed into our constitution. And then it's been used by the NIC in interpreting relationship between employer and employee and relevant stakeholders. So each of these form a very good baseline or baseline for principles that workplaces can adopt when they're coming up with policies. Policies to guide internal uh, engagement and policies to guide external engagement. It's extremely important. Um, it's extremely important because you want to show the people that um, you relate with, your stakeholders, the government, that um, you are a value-driven business. So if you have a code of conduct that embodies all of this, and the expectation is that people who deal with you must comply with all of this, right? Within the context of your code of conduct, having simplified it, it goes a long way in building your brand um, equity. It goes a long way in building your employer brand, right? And then your um, EVP. Uh, moving ahead. Okay, moving ahead, um, I'd like us to talk about the duties of employer. Now, the beauty about the duties is, is that it's like two sides of a coin. Where you find a duty, you find rights. So where you find duties of employer, you find rights of employee. Now, within this context, you have payment of wages as one of the duties of the employer. Um, unless it's gratuitous, and of course, if it's gratuitous, that particular person is not an employee. So um, an employee is entitled to his wages. Um, you have the issue on legal tender, you know, which has been explained within the context of the Labor Act. So you are not paying in kind. You must pay in cash. And the cash that we know is Nigerian cash. And then if you are having a contract where uh, the denomination is in foreign currency. It has to be denominated because there's a CBM policy, 2015 policy that speaks to dollarization of uh, contractual agreement against dollarization of contractual agreement. So it's very important that you take note of this as a compliance point. So even at the point in which that contract makes, even if that particular agreement you know, at the point when it crystallizes, there has to be an exchange rate to explain what basis of exchange rates will be used as against the Naira, as against whatever foreign currency you have put there. It has to be clearly specified in the contract. Um, relevant deduction. You have the Labor Act that speaks on the extent of deductions that can be made from um, an employee. Um, you also speak you also have uh, things that invalidate contracts and make contracts illegal as well. You have the Labor Act, the Labor Act speaks to this as well. Then of course, the employer has to provide work. 
when the employer can no longer provide work, the employer has failed in his duty. And then the employer that can no longer provide work can then decide to restructure, to say that, you know, uh, we, for efficiency purposes, for the fact that I can no longer pay you, manpower is too much. Maybe you can look at um, declaring a redundancy and then the relevant portions of the Labor Act would then kick in, you know, in resolving that particular um, matter. So I'd also brought in this case that I had mentioned earlier, which is Chokwenyi and Arif and um, others um, in resolving, in speaking to the provision of work. At that time, um, Greenwich Registrars acquired another company. I can't remember the name of the company now. And then what happened was that there was excess manpower. But instead of them to adopt the uh, redundancy framework that has been um, clearly spelled out in, and notoriously adopted by the court, right? When it comes to redundancy matters, uh, resolving redundancy related matters. What they simply did was to just ask the 40, 49 of them to just leave, they terminated their appointment. And then um, from then they went to court and um, the court held in their favor that what happened to them that time was redundancy and mandated Greenwich within a time frame, I think it's 14 days for them to resolve um, uh, and look into the requirements that has been spelled out within the Labor Act and then go back to court to give an account of what they have done. So um, sometimes it happens, the nature of work changes, but at the point when the nature of work changes, what do you do? You need to understand in empirical basis what has happened. You also need to communicate to the employees as to the nature of the events that have played out. If there is a need to restructure the contractual arrangements. Of course, you discuss this with your employees, but if that is not possible, if there has to be a layoff, just as we are seeing happening now these days with um, Facebook, with um, Twitter and the like, you know, um, if, if that is inevitable, then of course um, the redundancy, if redundancy payouts will have to be done. I see sometimes where um, organizations want to avoid liability. They say, um, what's that thing they even write uh, as reason for their letter, uh, as reason for termination? They say um, restructuring. We will come to that in the course of this presentation. But in terms of claiming your restructuring, the current position of the court is that you have to prove your case. The onus is on the employer. Once the employee takes the employer to court to say, I was wrongfully dismissed, the onus is on the employer to prove that that employee was not wrongfully dismissed. And the only way you can prove that he wasn't wrongfully dismissed. So as, as we mean that the employer claimed restructuring there has to be records that flows within those lines. Otherwise, that um, termination would, de would be declared as a wrongful and invalid termination. So it's important that as HR practitioners, we adopt an empirical view in our decision. So if we are letting an employee go on the basis of disciplinary action, we know the needful has been done when it comes to that. If it's on the basis of redundancy, we know the records shows this because it gets to, a, to get to a point in time when you will have to open up your record and prove that this was the reason. So even if you don't write it on your letter, in court, you will tell the judge that this is the reason why um, this happened in such a manner. Um, moving ahead, with uh, references and the uh, testimonials, of course, we've seen during onboarding, 
or before onboarding where you want to back check an employee. So this is a right, right, um, that um, the em employer has to back check um, all of this at the back end. So ensuring that the employee that is being brought on board, you know, is one that is trustworthy and truthful. And of course, health, safety, and welfare, indemnity, and vicarious liability. I mentioned this when I was discussing the ECA, that's the Employee Compensation Act on injuries arising out of the course of employment. Now, just going further and speaking directly to vicarious liability, an employee is a reflection of, of the company he works for. So any action he takes in the course of his employment, any action he takes in the course of his employment, as long as it is related to work, the employer, if there is a liability, the employer is going to be liable under common law. But of course, there are ways in which you can transfer this risk. So when I discuss with HR practitioners, I don't just like to put the problem on the table. I also, sell, I also suggest solutions and things that they can do as well to mitigate those things from happening. There are things that there are transfer metrics or, met, uh, or frameworks that you can adopt as an organization to ameliorate eventualities such as this. So for example, if you have a fleet of cars, right? What is compulsory under the law is that you get a third party insurance, okay? Um, within the context of your third party insurance, there is a limit of 1 million Naira. So imagine a situation where um, you put a, a car in the cost, uh, your car, you know, in custody of one of your drivers. And then there is an issue out there that transcends more than 1 million Naira. What that simply means is that you will be liable to make, um, to make good of that situation. You are able to indemnify the other party. So rather than speaking that grammar, you might want to look at the context of your policy document and maybe enter into an arrangement where you increase that, maybe it's a little premium or addition, additional premium than what you would ordinarily have had to pay, you know, when such happens, right? So those are one of the things that, you know, uh, measures, strategies that you can adopt, you can suggest, um, for your organization. Another thing is when you take up um, comprehensive cover, if you also have fleet of cars, full cars, what I've noticed is that the comprehensive cover have an employee liability clause where the underwriter, that's the insurance companies, they try to limit um, instances where they pay. So if you do not, if you do not take cognizance of those um, uh, liability clauses, you might be paying for a premium, thinking that you have a particular situation covered, but at the end of the day, you do not have a, that situation covered, right? So like that employer liability clause just simply states that if, for example, um, a manager has a car, right, assigned to him, if that um, manager gives his driver that car to drive and there is an issue, there is a liability, right? That's in strict interpretation, depending on how it's couched anyway, the strict interpretation of that employee liability clause simply means that since your driver drove that car and not you that you're supposed to drive that car, the, the, the insurance company would not be liable to indemnify for any loss that has occurred. So it's very important that, that just as uh, my friend had said earlier, that you work hand in hand with the legal department. I see situations where uh, the admin gets policy. Sometimes they don't even give it to the legal department to read or review. It's very important that you work hand in hand with the legal department, especially when it comes to being proactive, from a proactive point of view in looking at your indemnities and your liability. And framework that you have in place to mitigate those measures, where there are paperwork 
works, right? It's, it's very important that you engage your in-house lawyer or your external lawyer to look at your interest in such, a, in such regard. Then moving on to the duties of the employee, you have obedience and under obedience, at the other side of obedience is insubordination. So, um, and that is where having clear, precise, straight to the point, um, great communication of your policies and procedure comes in, right? To avoid ambiguity. I see handbooks and I'm asking myself who drafted this thing. I see handbooks and I'm seeing different lines. I'm seeing things that have different interpretations as much as possible. We should try to make our processes seamless. We should try to make our documentation easy. We should try to make it clear, clear man terms, so that you don't give varying interpretations to things, right? So that when issues arise, the other side will not now use it and tweak it to his advantage. It's clear for everybody to know. In terms of also passing that, uh, that um, policy out, it should be clear in, in uh, communicating that policy, what you intend to achieve with that policy. Um, lawful and reasonable um, instruction, yes. So you can't ask your, your subordinates to carry out an un unreasonable task, okay? So I remember a particular time in an organization where I worked, um, where I had to do some compliance filing with the Corporate Affairs Commission. So at that particular time, um, I did the filings, but then we couldn't get feedback early. And my boss at that time felt that I was the one delaying the process because he, in his views, he felt that I wasn't forthcoming, I wasn't following up, I wasn't pursuing it. And of course I explained, I said, well, the way CAC, with the way CAC works, TSC has now cut off human interference. You can no longer go to the CSC office, follow up on things, you can only, um, can only write to follow up or follow the docket um, method that has been set out to follow up on um, your filing. And then he said, well, it's Nigeria. I'm supposed to understand the way things work, I can go. But of course at the back end, I had my people in CAC that I could call and say, please, what's going on with that document? And they were giving me information. And you know, he mandated that I must fly to Abuja to follow up on it. And I knew that if I should go to Abuja, I will waste flight money to, to go to Abuja. And I will end up not achieving anything. I won't even be able to enter into the office. You know, so he was making an unreasonable request as far as, and most of us in the workplace, we pass through all of this. And then if, for instance, a disciplinary committee is set up and then they say in subordination, right? Those are the things that um, the courts will look at as to how reasonable your request is. So that's what this point um, basically addressed. But of course, it's not clear cut. The courts will look at this on a case by case basis. Um, also, duties of an employee, faithful service. Expectation is that employee, you shouldn't make secret profit. You are there to make profit on behalf of your employer. So if you put, position yourself in such a way to make secret profits, get kickbacks, bribe, commission um, from um, persons that deal with your organization, um, then of course, that's a breach of trust. And then it forms the basis for an employer, you know, even dismissing, depending on what the provision of your handbook say, even dismissing that particular employee. Um, on the other side, as HR practitioners, you should also not leave those aspects. Um, you shouldn't also take a top, top uh, position that are not cover those aspects. And when I'm saying not cover those aspects, you should also have a framework where employees can expose themselves. So you have disclosure forms. It also puts, because sometimes, right, um, we are connected as human beings. 
So it's even possible that maybe a vendor in a, an organization where you worked in is related to an employee within that organization, all right? So even where that employee is not in does not directly administer or is not in direct connection with a, a particular de department, it doesn't mean that it cannot influence his entry into that organization. So it's very important that you create an atmosphere of openness, right, of trust, where even when such a situation occurs, there is a disclosure metric. So you're able to monitor um, the activities of employees and the back end, and they know they don't have any excuse at the end of the day. So that if that connection existed and they didn't disclose where there are policies in place for them to disclose, then you know that they're try obviously trying to hide something and that strengthens your case when you want to proceed against such an employee in such an instance. Then you have competition. Um, working, an employee working for himself or uh, working for a third party. So let me start, I don't want to start with working for, for himself. Let me start with working for third party. Um, it's still hinged on the breach of trust and conflict, right? You can't enter into a nine to five arrangement with an organization and also take a nine to five arrangement with another organization. It, it, um, it's a breach of trust, okay? But then if such a situation happens and then you need to ameliorate salaries, then you can renegotiate your contract or you can have a framework where employees can renegotiate their contract in such an instance, but it speaks, you know, against the values. You, know? you should have a value, uh, what's the word now? You should have value metrics in your organization that speaks against that. You should have policies that speak, speaks against that, all right? But on the face of it, there is an implied breach of trust when an employee who has been engaged to work within a particular time frame uses that same time to work for um, another organization. It also includes working for himself as well. You should dedicate, and your, 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 your employees should dedicate the time that they have been engaged to work for that particular organization, to work for that um, particular organization. And speaking on um, competition, and I'm speaking on, in this instance, when I bring in the, bringing in the FCCPC, which is the Federal um, Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. Bringing in the FCCPC into the picture is that there's a section of the FCCPC which says that you can sign a non-compete for a period of not more than two years with an employee. But of course that kicks in so many issues. It brings in the issue of unfair labor practice, right? So, at the end of the day, what I simply advise is that for all is what, you need to assess what you're trying to protect if you don't want an employee to move to a competition after he leaves your organization. What is this thing worth to you? What will a reasonable man think about this thing? What's been what to you, right? Is this something worth protecting? So if the employee, was in custody of certain information that will prejudice you as, a, or as an organization when he leaves to a competition or him setting up his business. To what value does that thing what is it worth to you? How exclusive is that thing? That thing can it be assessed in the market or is it specific to you? Right? And then um, you should also part with compensation to cover that period in which you've told that employee not to work with the competition. You have to part with a, a consideration because when you um, adopt this principle of contract, right? It seems like there yeah, your contract of employment has ended. Okay, so what is the consideration for the new path that the employee is moving into? But well, those are just um, academic exercises, but then, um, Sometimes it helps to guide one because at the end of the day, in terms of uh, worst case scenario, those are the things that might end up playing out in court. 
But ultimately, um, I, I think that um, employees or employers rather should think of what impact any decision that they make will have on the value, on their value, on how they will be assessed in the market, on their brand at the end of the day. So it's not just enough to take a top front in certain things or say that this is how things should be done. But at the end of the day, how does, how does that in an empirical terms help your brand in the market at the end of the day? Would you be viewed as a top organization? Would you be viewed as a value-driven organization? How would people see you in the market? Well, what would your goodwill amount to in the market when you make this decision? Um, then abuse of um, confidential information as well. So um, employees have a duty not to abuse confidential information. It's strictly linked to that. And there are some certain things that employers can put in place. But at the end of the day, even though you sign confidentiality agreements, you have confidential, if there is no culture, if you haven't instilled that culture to secure that confidential information, whether in physical terms and or in moral terms, then it goes to no use having a confidential confidentiality clause in your agreement. Then um, speaking to the duty of to exercise care, skill and diligence, of course, you've been engaged as a skilled uh, technical professional expert. So it's expected that you bring in that progress and then your, your performance should also show it as well, right? Then the expected standard is not the standard of angels, but the standard of men, right? What would a reasonable professional in this particular instance do, right? If you're looking for a high flyer, uh, what will a high flyer do in this particular instance, right? So you're engaging persons to reasonably meet your demands. You should have um, performance metrics to adjudge this. You know this better than I do because um, you're in HR. And then um, this, this particular case is, for this Lista and Romford, what actually happened was that a father and son um, worked in a, an organization. And the son gave his, no, the son injured his father with, with the car that he was given to use in that organization. And the father sued the organization and claimed liability for that. And then the company in exchange sued the son and claimed the loss for having paid the father for the injury that he has sustained. It's funny, right? But it just shows you those whole, it's, it's an England case, but it just shows you the dynamics behind um, exercise of care and skill. To what extent would that case apply in Nigeria? Um, I would say that um, the Labor Act, again, has provided um, the kind of deductions and the extent of deductions that can be made from an employee, the nature of deductions that can be made from an employee's salary. There's also gone for that to say that when an employee salary will be uh, surcharged, you have to meet up with certain criteria. And one of those is that you need a labor officer to assent or consent to it. So I don't know if I'm a labor officer, I will not consent to it. So I don't know which labor officer will do that. But um, at the end of the day, um, he who owns that property should apply um, the um, the most acceptable extent of mitigation uh, metrics to protect um, that property. And then in the event of eventualities, you know, should have something in place to um, cover for the loss of such a property. If you want to take uh, disciplinary action against an employee for the loss, right? You will have to apply fair hearing to understand the dynamics behind the, how the whole incident happened. And applying fair hearing, you have to be fair. 
just as it says, right? Um, in coming to a conclusion. So it's it's possible if you find that our employee uh, applied, was reckless in, in his activities that had, has led to that injury, you know, there's a possibility for you to take disciplinary action against that employee. And that is basic, that would basically be dependent on what you have within the context of your disciplinary procedure. And to what extent of allowance you want to allow within your organization. So moving ahead, so controversies and emerging issues, I've mentioned some of them, but let me just breeze through this. The concept of hire and fire. I think we're getting to a point where this controversial issue of hire and fire is a bit fizzly, is a bit fizzly enough. And I'm saying fizzly enough because we are seeing the direction in which the NIC is going now these days. They seem to be pro international best practice. So even though we haven't adopted the convention that speaks to, excuse me, my son is here. What was Thank you, Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about human rights. <laughs> okay, so um, we're almost getting to the end. So the direction of the National Industrial Courts from the thick common law principle of you know higher and fire to I don't need to give you reason or any reason, bad, good reason whatsoever to a departure from that in a very and Aloysius in Diamond Bank, you know, and then the case of Belo Ibrahim and Echo Bank, right? Um, in which the judgment was given, I think sometime in 2021, speaking to that now directly speaking to the trend, right? I'm moving away from the old principle of, um, the common law principle and just simply just telling you that you have to give reason. And I did mention that the onus is on the employer to tell the court that, or to prove to the court that that termination was not wrongful. So at the end of the day, you still have to give that reason. If you didn't give that reason in your letter, you will still have to give the court the reason. There's still a bit of disparity. So sometimes you read some cases and the courts hold strong on international best practice. You see some judgments, the courts hold strong on um, common law principles and just strict censors interpreting the context, content of the employment contract that the parties have entered into. I've given you your one month in lieu of notice, so I, I don't owe you anything anymore, right? But then there's now a moral side of it to say that, how was that person exited? That's where the human right now comes in. Is that, was there fair hearing? In instances where fair hearing should be applied, um, fair labor, where, where, was fair labor practice adopted? In, in instances where the court feels that um, fair labor practice has been breached or ought to be applied. Then uh, just moving ahead of that, outsourcing. But just to be clear on that, it's very important that, and I did mention that earlier, still on hiring and firing, that HR practitioners must be empirical on their actions. You have to rely on data. You can't just rely on word of mouth. So for example, if it's a disciplinary action, you must have your end covered now. Eyewitnesses, depending on the situation, you know, report from people, put it in your file, you know, so that in the event that uh, that person um, eventually goes to court to challenge that action taken, you have your documentation to speak for you. Unfortunately, sometimes when um, you find cases such as this, HR, HR does not have documentation. You will see HR, trying to evade, they say they don't even want to go to court to represent the company. They say legal should do that, or the line manager should do that. No, it doesn't speak well of uh, HR 
practitioners and he doesn't speak well of the company, right? So it's very important that we guide the process and we guide the organization in doing what's right. Then moving to outsourcing, we've seen issues. I wrote down something on, on um, outsourcing, right? As good as outsourcing might be, um, and the fact that um, you have specific legislation that speaks to outsourcing, right? It speaks to, you know, just this, just you have sections that speak to and in recognition of outsourcing. You still don't have um, a specific uh, regulation that guides outsourcing contracts. So you find a lot of things happening within that space, even though the, the that sector is a huge money spinner, you know, within the HR space, like from, from the information I gathered it, globally it's worth $85 billion, right? And then it's a great uh, framework for you to help companies to focus on their, their primary, the primary reason why you're in the market. And it will be an awesome, great way to incorporating those even within the um, informal sector to formalize their activities. It will be a fantastic way. But then you have issues such as disparity and discrimination within the uh, sourcing framework, uh, promoting cheap labor, right? Actually within the banks. So the example given in an article that I read, they try to explain that in some banks, you have a salary range of 50K, 80K for those in outsourcing. And then those that are permanent staff end times three. You know, you're already open. Actually, when those in outsourcing are doing basically the same thing that the permanent staffs are doing or the regular staffs are doing, you're opening yourself to issues on discrimination. So it's very important that you consider this. And then um, you have issues on, um, okay, yes, uh, profit sharing, two weeks on discrimination, the negative psychological effect uh, as a result of the treatment and low self-esteem, right? If they can prove mental um, issue from that, that's also a, a, an issue that companies will, will grapple with. Sunset career goals. So I engage you in this particular position. There is no avenue for growth. I keep renewing your contract day in, year out. No avenue for career growth, right? And then on the issue on remote working, so many in three cases, right, has arisen as a result of COVID. Even though it's made uh, for remote and flexible working, uh, coming into the mainstream, it has also opened quite a number of issues as well. We, we have the expansion of liabilities in this instance. And it's very important that HR, HR practitioners try as much as possible to adopt policies that accommodate every gap that um, would arise from remote working. Um, adopting work, work tools within remote working and um, your security infrastructure, your security framework to help to, um, you know, to help to manage information, right? So that your information doesn't get into the wrong hands. So you, you use your work to restricted access. Now there was a case, um, an American, no, Netherlands case, of of um, of a man who works in a software company, and you know by virtue of international best practices, it will apply in Nigeria if the NIC decides to apply it. So it's also good we read wide as well and advise our organization. So in this particular case, um, they went on. Uh, they were asked to proceed on. During the heightened period of the pandemic, they were asked to work from home. Now, within that period, they were asked to work from home. He was this particular staff was mandated by his um, supervisor 
to switch on his webcam for the whole nine hours that he expected to work. And he refused. He said he would do no such thing because it is in his private space now. Why will you be infringing on my privacy? And then three days down the line, his appointment was terminated. He wasn't even given an opportunity to, to write, right? He was abruptly terminated, terminated his appointment. And he sued for wrongful um, termination and gave made his case based on the events that he played out. And the court held in his favor that his right to privacy was, was, would have been infringed on and his termination was wrong. And guess what? He was awarded $70,000 on basis of wrongful termination, right? So the issue on privacy is still a bit new within our clients, but you see, privacy speaks to fundamental human rights, just as I've said, and it is non-negotiable. So you need to come up with, you know, um, more, more humane policies to help accommodate um, the intricacies that remote working presents. Then I've spoken about uh, personal data you know, while speaking, right? Um, so we take note of that. But then let me just note that it is very important that you don't ask your employees to provide too much, too much information, more than what you ordinarily need. Because part of the things that um, the NDPR provides is that you only collect the data that you need for the purpose of that arrangement. And what gives you the power to collect the data is because you have an employment contract, right? Within a reasonable period after that employment contract, if you need to keep that data, you keep it. You keep the data well and ensure that uh, third parties do not have access to that data because it's possible for you to be brought to question on breach of personal data. Uh, moving ahead, you have the National Health Insurance Scheme that was just signed on. Unlike the previous framework, all employees will now be required to key into the scheme, right? So it's important that you note this in your, uh, what's it called now? Your cost out, your, your cost center for year 2023, because by that time there will be full implementation. By the time the regulation comes out, most likely there will be full implementation of the National Health Insurance Scheme. And then if you currently have an HMO, see how you can, your HMO can partner with the existing National Health Insurance Scheme just to help cut costs as well. So those are the discussions that you might be having with your current um, HMOs. Then you have the issue of strike. we are still not recovered from the ASU strike, right? So, the controversy really is, is there a right to strike as provided under section 41 to 43 of the Trade Dispute Act, you know? So, uh, but just to conclude, to conclude, yes, I have some strategies. I had mentioned during the course of my presentation, I've mentioned quite a number of strategies already. But then just to sum this up, you know, as organizations, we need to pick the right partners. And we start to build our culture from the onboarding process, our recruitment process, selection process. We pick the right partners internally and externally. And we also share this drive with them so that, uh, and bind them to it. It's very really external. Like our external stakeholders, we find them to it so that they will also create that culture within their organization. And you can do that through a supplier or a vendor code of conduct. The first time I got wind of a vendor code of, code of conduct was when um, I was working with um, a multinational. We had to do business with another multinational. Um, that was when the first time I got wind of it. And then they noted some certain things, forced labor, we won't be involved in forced labor, we won't be involved in terrorism. You know, things, they just mentioned all of those things in, in brief bullet points, right? The money laundering, 
And you can do that so that you share your values with the people that work with you, even externally. It helps to build your brand portfolio or your brand profile. Carry out a HR audit from time to time. If you cannot afford to get an external person to do, do that internally and document it. It goes a long way in exposing the gaps that you have within your organization. Yeah, my battery is low. Then um, embedding the principles of business and human rights is very, very important. As we've seen, human resources, they are humans, they are not machines. So um, they're setting non negotiables. And it is very important that you have those principles embedded within your day-to-day -day operations so that you don't have, you don't run foul of them, right? And then um, you have an enterprise approach to your processes. You have an organizational approach in your processes. I've worked with an organization where, where all of us were working in silos and we're just trying to protect our top. So I know what it is to work in a quote unquote um, hostile environment because what you're trying to basically do is protect your own side. <laughs> but it, it, at the long run, it's not good, it's not healthy for the organization, right? When each department protects their own side. So it's important that we have an enterprise of approach in our processes and driving our processes is very important. And then building a legal risk management culture and architecture. I can't emphasize this more. It's important that you have compliance registers that will help you to proactively plan ahead of ahead of time. I was listening to a video a, a while ago. He's, he, he basically said that business is a, a, a one thing to make profit. And then there are two persons who work with the business, the one that brings in the profit and the one that makes it easy to bring in the profit. But he, he forgot something. If I'm bringing in the profit, how am I bringing in the profit? If I'm creating liabilities for you, or if I don't have a proactive approach in managing the risk on how you bring in the profit, your liability might one day go up your profit. So it's very important. And I think HR practitioners have a very huge role to play in this instance, in guiding their, the businesses that they work with to have a proactive and a risk uh, management approach, not just legal, operational, you know, business, technical, a risk management approach in addressing issues. It's not about the, 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 the top line, it's the bottom line. Yes, top line is good because we need money money coming in but then excuse me at the end of the day when that money coming in is being got by something down there in which you would have a vch if you were proactive then um, i think we, we failed as a business right you can't make revenue you need to make profit and that profit has to sit right and then as pro um women right or, or women today is the third day of uh, the third day of um, excuse me of um, the advocacy against violence against women so from time to time you can have this drive within your organization just to give credence to things that are happening in the global space to create a consciousness it still speaks to empathizing with the human element that you have within your organization. Thank you very much, and I'm open to questions. Thank you so, so much, Barista Vivia. This has been bigger than I anticipated. You have Thank exceeded you. expectations. We'll be able to take maximum of five questions. So if you have a robust question, uh, if you have a robust question, you may raise your hand. Let me quickly check through the uh, chat box to see if there are any questions. Um, Before I say, please, what's the statutory requirement 
for the NIHS. I suspect she's saying NHIS. I suspect that NHS. document is available online. Yes. Okay, NHIS, just Google it. I, the document should be available um, online. We can, if you're on the platform, HR message, we can start for it and share it again on it. Uh, let me also see. Um, if Felix Akete said, says that, does it mean an employer can't decide on his own to deduct an employee's salary? I think that's a clarification. Mm, okay. No, you can't decide to deduct an employee's salary. No, there has to be a basis for you to deduct an employee's salary. And the Labor Act specifies the basis. One is if you're deducting the employee's salary on the basis of um, union dues. If you're deducting the employee's salary on the basis of fine, then it means that um, the fine is arising from a disciplinary action. So what steps have you taken? Um, in coming to that, you have to document all of those. And then the Labor Act, there are four, four um, uh, rationales for deductions, as sal uh, for, for dedu really deduc statutory deductions that you make. And there's one other which I can't remember now. But then at the end of the day, the Labor Act ended up, <laughs> ended up by saying that in terms of um, those other deductions, you need, like, fine, most expressionally you need the consent of a labor officer. So it's a requirement. If you don't have that and you are brought to question on that particular issue, the Labor Act might come into play, you know, will be brought into play in interpreting the actions that you have taken. So um, it's a direct answer to that question is no, cannot, unless there is a prior agreement to do so on the basis of those rationales that um, already mentioned. I hope okay. I've addressed your question. Yes, you have. Okay. Um, somebody asked that, for example, in Lagos, where is the labor officer? Or who is the labor officer? Where can you reach any labor officer in any state? Okay, so each state, I'm aware that each state has a coordinator that acts on behalf of, I know for, I know about Ogun State because most of, the businesses I work with are located in the state. But I, I want to believe that there's a labor coordinator in Lagos State because from time to time they carry on factory visits and they don't come from Abuja. It's Lagos, they have a, a Lagos office here. But at the moment, I don't have any numbers. I don't know of any, but I'm, I'm, I don't know of any, right? I have an interface with any of them. But for administrative purposes, they should have. A, a labor officer situated here in Lagos. Okay, so someone says the issue of privacy is greatly ignored by most employers in this part of the world. Ma, would you classify an employer constantly calling for Zoom meetings during your off days, off time, and infringement <laughs> outside work oh. hour? Lagos City. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's a yes and no. And I say it's a yes and no, because when you are engaged for work, there is a time in which you're expected to work, right? Um, so if you give a strict interpretation to the period in which you've been engaged to work, yes. But then there's some allowances that can be given. And if it's of reasonable interpretation, now what's reasonable interpretation? If you yourself, you're saying that, you will be requested on a Zoom is unreasonable. If you ask another person and you say, nah, no, no, that is unreasonable now, right? Um, those are the criteria that will, the court would look at in addressing such matters. Okay. Someone says if a driver breaks a traffic law and the vehicle is fine, can the employer deduct the fine from the employee, the employee now being the driver's salary? I think Barista's uh, network is freezing. I hope it is not my own network. Let's just be patient.
Okay, so Adanaya, you are saying you need clarification. Are you saying it is better a, an HR person goes to court to represent a case instead of the company lawyer? No, she's not saying that, but at least the HR should be able to accompany the lawyer. Okay, and if they need to provide the testimony or feedback or information, or you know, if they need someone to examine or cross examine for the organization, HR should readily be available for that and not just be pushing maybe line manager or other stakeholders. Okay, we are still hoping she can join us. I will try my little best to respond to the questions here. Um, so Roli says, is there a labor law act for annual leave allowance? I can answer that question confidently. The labor law just speaks to the minimum number of days employees can go on leave. It is silent as to whether I should pay leave allowance or not pay leave allowance. However, the leave are paid is a paid leave. In other words, if you go for six days, they will not deduct salary of six days from you because you didn't come to work for those six days. But whether you should not pay an additional leave allowance, the labor law is completely silent about that. But general practice in Nigeria and some other parts of the world, they now also pay you a leave allowance in addition to the fact that your leave is a paid leave. Um, Sandra says, are casual or contract employees entitled to pension and HMO by, by law? So, you know, by saying by law, you have made it uh, a little more complicated because if you check the labor law, the word casual or contract is not very prominent in that labor law because uh, the labor law generally even frowns against um, casualization of, of, of employees. It will be assumed that um, if you, are, you have a contract, it's a short term thing, maybe six months, three months, and it's over. Not that on a permanent ongoing basis, you now make those people contracts, then that may be proven as real employment. And in that instance, um, you may be doing a disservice to those employees. And that's why many organizations, what they have done, instead of running contract staff on and on, they outsource those staff to another organization. So because they are outsourced, they are full-time employees of another organization, and in that other organization, they will be getting pension and they will have um, eligibility to benefit from HMO. So my own advice is once it's more than three months or six months, don't continue to have contract staff in perpetuity. If they get a good lawyer, they will win any case against you because it means you are just looking for cheap labor, which is described as what? Casualization of labor. Forgive me, I may skip some questions because I'm not a lawyer, I'm just the son of a lawyer, which doesn't make me a lawyer, okay? Um, let me see. If an employee exposes the company to avoidable loss, is it wrong to surcharge, surcharge the employee for its replacement? Okay, so it depends on, on the kind of loss and the kind of item. So there are certain things, for example, an organization will be expected to have insurance policy of cover. So if there is a loss, you should be able to get insurance to cover it. Because what if the cost, there are certain equipment, take a vehicle, maybe it's 24 million error. Where would the driver recover the money from? Even if you want to be deducting the money from the driver, how many months or years will it take you to recover the money? So there are certain risk, um, um, risk strategies we also need to adopt so that with the liability is not always on the organization in all um, instances. Okay, thank you so much, um, Madam Longeloa Funke. She has graciously shared the link to the NHIA Act with you. Okay, um, somebody is saying, how can you deal with a boss that is an expatriate and doesn't comply to Nigerian labor law? Okay, it terminates appointment whenever it feels like it debits and deducts staff salary with no cost. It does not allow employer to observe annually. What can be done in that situation as HR? If the HR is bold enough and willing to take the necessary risk, you can actually petition. Okay, you, you, you can petition. 
there are different areas to petition. The one, you can go to court and then sue with your information, but you know the implications of that. Chances that you will remain their employee after going to court will be very slim, but you can win the case and win the case for your, your subordinates. Now, um, I've seen somebody even petition um, the embassy of the expatriate. So some people are that bold and daring, sent a letter to the embassy with information. By the time the embassy called that person, they had to adjust their behavior because they were shocked that how will somebody go and report me to, to, to my embassy? Of course, there are also whistleblowing platforms and um, advocacy, human rights lawyers that you can go through that they will write. So for example, if the person is not paying pension, you can also petition um, the National Pension Commission. Of course, once they get a letter from the commission, you know what will follow. They will start trying to say who escalated, who reported, who did the usual blame. There may be some backlash, but you may end up you know, protecting other employees or getting them to do the right thing. One of the problems we have in this part of the world is that we are not litigant by nature. In quotes, you know, we just leave it for God. In quotes now, in quotes. You know, if more people went to court and we get justice, um, less people will, will be good. Of course, I recognize the fact that one reason why people also avoid going to court is that court cases in Nigeria take a very long time. And people will say, do I want to spend five years, eight years chasing after a case in court? So it can be time consuming. Okay, I'm still open that our facilitator will come. If she's not back by nine o'clock, we will have to end this conversation there. Okay, what I can do, I can drop her phone number in the chat box. Like I mentioned, she's a practicing lawyer. So uh, if you reach out to her, you may do well to uh, perfect her brief. If you know, you know. If you don't know, talk to your lawyer. Okay, um, all right. Um, again, Sandra. Sandra, I have any questions, so I like that. But I think um, you said, yeah, if an employee fails to send in a weekly report, is it proper to find them according to the code of conduct in the company? Except the code of conduct has been, you know, upfront. It has been captured in that code of conduct that if you don't do this, you will be fined by this. And the employees and the representatives of the employees or the union have signed to it. But I strongly suspect that in this case, it will most likely be a one-man business where the employees, so to speak, don't have any choice but to either sign the employee handbook or exit the organization. But it doesn't sound right, it doesn't sound fair. Why are people not submitting reports? You may need to troubleshoot, okay? Okay, what if you, sound, um, you know, they move money this week? What if they keep doing it every week? Would you just keep deducting the money? It doesn't look like a sustainable um, solution and it shows that um, there are deeper issues with motivation in the organization, all right? So HR2 needs to be proactive so that it's not like all our steps are sanctioned, sanctioned, sanctioned. Um, let me see if there's another question I can take care. Um, if you're a lawyer too in the house and you have answers to some of these questions, please raise your hand. Um, I'll be excited to allow you to, to speak, all right? Um, I see one hand up. Um, are they call your mom? Oluwakemi, Oluwakemi, are they call your mom? I don't know if you want to ask a question or respond. You can quickly, your hand has been up for a while. Please go ahead yeah. with your question or comment. Thank you. Yes, good evening, sir. So I want to, I wanted to ask about the NSITF, which is about. So if an organization decides to onboard the NSITF, are they liable to pay all the backlogs or they just start from let's say 2023? Um, just a minute. She's in the waiting room. I'm admitting her here. I'm, I'm admitting her into the room. So I will want the lawyer to respect, uh, respond to that. But what I suspect is um, if you are just subscribing to the National Health Insurance Fund, I will expect that from the year or period you subscribe is when you begin to pay. So I won't look at it from a tax perspective. I know if it was something like tax, they can backdate it to the day you started operations and you had employees. But the concept with NSITF is 
you can get benefits for your employee. Now, you can't go and bad dates and get benefits for last year or two years ago. So my intelligent position will be, you won't need to pay arrears. But hopefully, let's see the, let me confirm if my Lord has- Yes, because why I'm asking, I was told that based on the acts, um, if you if you subscribe, let's say in this year, 2022, you have to pay about the backlog of 11 years backward. So that's I'm asking this question. Wow. If, if, if that is true, what will happen is it won't encourage more people. Yes, to yes, it won't encourage them. People will just avoid them completely. Doesn't yes, you them. avoid them. And they will keep calling, calling, and they say they'll take you to court. Okay. Madam Vivian, are you with us now? Yes, my apologies. No, so my is. battery, no, no, my you, battery you, went you, you off. Just stay on the conversation, leave that one, we understand. Yeah, at least we know you're yes. not in Canada. So somebody is saying that if you register with NSITF, say this year or now, and maybe you've been yes. existing for 10, 15 years, would you be required to pay the backlog? Uh, but what's their policy? It depends on what their policy is. And then um, what what was your conversation? Because I, I think I heard someone speaking about paying backlog. And what, what was the conversation with the NSITF? Well, the NS, when we wanted to onboard, so they didn't tell us about the backlog. So a client of ours who happened to work in the Abuja branch was the one that now gave us that insight and said, please be aware. If you decide to now onboard or subscribe to them from 2022 or 2023, you're liable to pay all the backlogs that they are usually silent on that. They will not tell you. So mm. for me, I'm like 11 years backwards. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some of the staff that were in the company must have left, you know, yes. and most organizations yes. will not want to come on board because it would be discouraging. Why pay 11 years back? And that's 1% mm. annual for their gross salary, you know, for about 200 or let's say 1,000 staff, and you're going to pay backlog of 11 years based on the act. I don't think that is encouraging. So that's why I'm actually asking to know if truly that is what is obtainable. What I would suggest, and you can get this online, if you use Google, just search for Nigerian Social Insurance Trust for the okay. Act, so that you okay. can read it. It will be written in black and white. Most government okay. pass a house like that act strictly based on their heart. If it's written there, then that is the law. If it's not written there, then maybe there is a gazette or, or <laughs> something. But there are some interesting comments in the chat box. I will also encourage you to read. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, let me just add, let me just add within the context of what the law provides, there is no place within the act that states that you should pay back law. Right, there's no place within the act that states you should pay backlog. So it maybe it's the particular officer you had the discussion with. You might need to write them officially to let them know that um, you want to um, apply, right, for your NSI. Make your normal remittances and then, you know, you take it up from there because the deductions that you are making is 1% from your employee's um, salary. I am making that relevant deductions um, on behalf of your employee to avoid liabilities. So you might need to um, confirm maybe from another officer and then write them officially for, to understand what their requirements are and follow through on that. That would just be my suggestion. Okay, so we'll take the last question for tonight from Baye Ada. Question or comment? Bye. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Mm. I just want to buttress on NSITF. It is mandatory. Well, if you need your compliance certificate, you need to pay backlog. Whether there is law backing it up or not, when you go, even if you go to Abuja head office, it is compulsory you pay all the backlogs. So your, your CAC date of registration, 
they will have to work it out for you to pay all the back bills for you to get all your compliance certificate. It's not mandatory to NSITF, you know? uh, even ITF had all statutory deduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Based on Thank that you. submission, I completely align. I understand where you are coming from. If you need a compliance certificate for a particular year, by default, you must have paid for that year. And if you need compliance certificate, which means you must show from when you started the operation that you've been compliant year on year. So it's only logical that evidence that you comply is that you paid. And then they will give you the sad thing is that even though you are paying now, you can't get any benefit for the past again. However, the compliance certificate itself is a kind of benefit because most people who need this certificate maybe are trying to bid for a project, maybe another government project or another third party project and you need the compliance certificate as part of your documentation. So you now have an interest, which may be future commercial prospect. The, I think for me, I would say any rule, law or, um, you know, concern of the land, corporate, let us abide with it. Don't let us say maybe the government today is not following up because you don't, you don't know the day there will be another pharaoh that will not know Joseph or there will be a revival in the land, and somebody will say from 1960, they will be auditing everybody. If you have been doing the right thing every time, you will have no, uh, nothing to fear. But if not, the organization or the owners of the organization may pay for the sins of management of former years that they were not even um, in existence. Anyway, we always say organization is a continuum, or at least till they fold up. If they don't fold up, the assets and liability, the goodwill, you continue to manage it. I'd like to thank sincerely everybody who joined this call. Um, Barista Vivian, your closing remarks so that we can go. So it's important that our resource um, managers or personnel that we bring back the human in human resource. And I say bring back the human resource because um, we seem to have taken that out of the context in human resources. We seem to, you know, it might not apply to you. And it's important that we do that because we're dealing with humans. And the un underlining aspect of dealing with humans is the fact that there are certain fundamental and non-negotiables. And when we're called to question, we would have to show ourselves worthy that we have um, we are in compliance with certain processes we're in compliance with the law with the statutes with the documentations that we have pushed forward within our various organizations to be compliant with and then our profession now status is also to question as well right so it's very important that we hold uh, our professional standing um, in higher esteem because as professionals, we have standards to uphold. And that is, and standards, right, are, I don't want to say they are non-negotiable, but it, it's what makes us who we are as professionals. So I hear human resources saying that it is what management wants that we will do. But at the end of the day, how would that impact in your career? How does that impact in the perception that you have built within your career? How people perceive you? And then, um, so we should always be proactive. We should always be futuristic in our approach, our advice. Um, and in our undertakings on things, the empirical, it's important that we are data driven in anything that we do. It might seem that with law, we are more artistic than being data driven. It's not true. When push comes to shove, once we are asked to show cause, we have to bring out those data. I've seen judgments where um, the judges are based the lawyers for picking up records. It, it doesn't, and I know these lawyers, doesn't speak well of this. These are public documents. Now ask yourself, do you want to 
be aligned with an organization that their values have been brought to question within the public space, that their processes have been brought to question within the public space. So it's very important that we push through the, uh, the ideals of the profession in every organization that we find ourselves in. And then if we need to take the exit, do not hesitate to take the exit. Because in the nearest future, you will find out that um, it pays at the end of the day. And then um, the objective in our advice, right? And then as much as possible as well, seek counsel, cross-border counsel from lawyers internally. And that is why I really applaud the purpose and the objectives for which this group is set up, right? It's open. We have people who share the challenges and then we see various streams of advices that come in. You know, you hardly find that. You hardly find that in a community. You have people that are holding on to their opinions or you have people that are holding on to their ideals. They don't open up, you know, when it comes to issues of this. So lean on uh, an HR professional who has been there open up tell them the challenges that you're facing and be professional in their in our approach be proactive in our approach thank you for this opportunity i appreciate thank it. you so much by data i'm i'm sure barista also means evidence track record evidence thank you so much madam you have done well for us we appreciate it.